Welcome back to the Chasing Mountains podcast. Today we are talking about Harlan Sanders, or better known as Colonel Sanders, the Colonel at Kentucky Fried Chicken. My teenage years, I ate so much KFC. I'm I'm surprised I'm alive. I mean, because <laughs> like if I eat it now, my stomach's upset. Just the grease, the 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 chicken. First off, how American is that? It's like we're gonna give you a lot of chicken, and it's gonna be in a bucket. <laughs> I think that's very Kentucky as well. Oh, Not Lord. only American, but very Kentucky. His face is the brand of the entire multi-billion-dollar corporation. Mm-hmm. Obviously, didn't start as a multi-billion-dollar corporation. Where did KFC start? How did how did we get there? He worked a, a long list of a variety of jobs throughout his life, and I know we're going to talk about his life because it's there's some fireworks. Like there's just he's a little rough around the edges, yeah. like we said. This man was kind of crazy, but also kind of genius in his own right. So, well, I think a lot of people, myself included, until we dug into this, sort of thought that he was just a guy that was selected to be the, like a brand ambassador. Like, hey. Right. You got the look Ronald that we're McDonald. going for. I don't really think that there's a, an actual like clown out there. God, I hope there's not a clown. No, now we need to look into it. God, because we were wrong about about Colonel Sanders. Mm-hmm. But like even the name Colonel Sanders, like he wasn't a colonel in the military, but it was like a formal Kentucky governor thing that was bestowed upon him to get that title. Like that's a thing they did in Kentucky. So they just what gave out a medal that says you're now a colonel. They called an honorific title, like the highest recognition awarded by the Commonwealth of Kentucky, and it's the, the Kentucky Colonel. Again, I thought he was just kind of a kind of like a brand ambassador or or a brand, um, almost like a made up figure. But he was he was the founder and had like quite a personality, Mm -hmm. very central to the brand itself. So yeah, so he worked all these different jobs and eventually started selling fried chicken from his roadside restaurant in Kentucky during the Great Depression. Which back then, roadside restaurants were very important. You couldn't travel that far without air conditioning in your car for very long. Mm -hmm. And they would stop off at these restaurants to fill up with gas. It's very slow too. So you're you're not going to take these like really far off side roads. These highways where you're going 85 miles an hour didn't happen. It was 55 most of the time if your car could get that fast. So these roadside diners were were huge. Yeah. So during that time, he developed his secret recipe. And that's the patented method of cooking chicken in a pressure fryer. It cooked it faster than pan frying. And he eventually like patented that. It wasn't until his 60s in 1952 when he began franchising the KFC recipe. The yep. leaven herbs and spices that we've all heard about, plus the pressure cooking. Mm-hmm. In 1952, he, he franchised the secret recipe, which he called Kentucky Fried Chicken, to a guy named Pete Harmon in South Salt Lake, Utah. Colonel Sanders came along and said, okay, you can start selling my chicken, my recipe in your restaurant. We don't have to call the place KFC. It's your restaurant. It's a successful restaurant, but I want you to be able to sell my product essentially. And so in the first year of selling the product, restaurant sales more than tripled with 75% of the increase coming from the, the sales of fried chicken. He franchised that recipe, I guess, to several other owners. Every time he did it, he got four cents per chicken Is was the arrangement. Every time it sold? Yeah. So he probably wasn't getting rich off this at the moment. No. But he was actually making money. And you said he was in his 60s, right? Yeah. So what happened is the main restaurants he started, like the primary one, the first one that was doing so well, I guess there was specifically it was Interstate 75 was introduced and it sort of rerouted a bunch of traffic. And mm-hmm. so to your point that you just said, people are not going to really go off the main route to track down a restaurant. It's not like jumping off at an exit today and going to the KFC in a local right. town. Like it just, it didn't work that well, way. Sometimes when those main highways came through, entire towns died because right. they relied their whole income was based on travelers. Mm -hmm. And if those travelers weren't coming through, I mean, they weren't making money. And that was the case here. Which if if you've ever seen cars. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Were were they on Route 66? Was it Route 66? Might've been. When that new highway came through, they thought people would get off the exit and come see them. They were excited, but then they realized it was killing the town. Yeah. And that's exactly what happened here. And so do you want to get into the part where he shot and almost killed somebody? And there was a big feud between him and another restaurant. One of the themes I think that we'll come away with today is that like he, as I said, he's just rough around the edges. Rough. Didn't back down from a fight. In fact, he was known for fist fighting. (laughs) He was known for fighting, got fired several times in his career. Um, One of his ideas for branding was he would make deals with farmers to paint on the side of their barn so that when people were coming into town, they could see this beautiful sign that he and his friends had painted about his restaurants. And a competitor didn't like that. He didn't like that he was getting all this, as he thought, free advertisement. So he started painting over these uh, billboard signs on the side of barns, and it started a feud. Matt Stewart was the the name of the competitor. 
Yeah, and apparently Stewart killed a Shell employee, like a Shell gas station employee. Because it wasn't his restaurant at a Shell gas station. Yeah, I think that's what it was. This is what Wikipedia said, which I think is funny. I'm just going to read it word for word because it's, I think it's funny. Stewart killed a Shell employee who was with Sanders and was convicted of murder, eliminating Sanders competition. (laughs) So, (laughs) so by way of like the fact that Stewart went to jail, Mm -hmm. then the competition was limited. (laughs) And so he he was, you know, it worked out for the best. Talk about, you, you you think about all these competitors these days who will do ruthless things. These guys were actually taking guns out and shooting at each other. Because of the rerouting of that, that interstate, it basically left him at 65 years old with, you know, whatever savings he had and $105 a month from social security. He decided to start aggressively franchising his chicken concept beyond just kind of these few, few restaurants. He was 65 years old. Props to him. Most people, well, I'm too old to do anything. Yeah. I or giving up. Giving yeah. up. He would often sleep in the back of his car when he would visit restaurants. He would offer to cook his chicken. And if the workers liked it, then he would negotiate franchise rights. So he's sleeping with a bunch of pressure cookers in the back of his yeah. car? <laughs> yeah. That's a hustle, man, right there. Yeah. At 65 years old. Wow. This tenacity that he has, this this aggression, this like get after it kind of nature. I don't know if it, if it was cultivated through his life experiences or if he was born with it, but he worked for multiple railroads, which is not a easy no. job. He also sold insurance. He started a, a ferry boat company, which he eventually sold for $350,000 of like today's money basically mm. is what it would be. And then he started an acetylene lamp company. I thought this was kind of funny. He was, he was fired, as I said, several times for fighting and insubordination throughout all this. He even at one point was practicing law and he got into a courtroom brawl that started basically between him and his only client. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he's like, so it didn't go very well. I want to read what his biographer said. Sure. Colonel Sanders biographer, John Ed Pierce. He wrote, Sanders had encountered repeat failure, largely through bullheadedness, a lack of self-control, impatience, and a self-righteous lack of diplomacy. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's what our uh, biographers will say too. Yeah, probably. <laughs> so the, the KFC brand is worth eight and a half billion, hmm. sees about 26 billion in sales, and it's one of the world's top 100 most valuable brands. And it came from this goofball who would fight his own clients in court. <laughs> I don't know if you saw this. But have you hopped on Twitter and looked at their Twitter page? No. So if you go to KFC official Twitter. But their social media is really good, right? Their social media is wonderful. If you click on who they follow, you'll notice that they only follow 11 people. And five of them are the Spice Girls. And six of them are guys named Herb. Basically, it's 11 herbs and spices. That's their recipe. So that's the joke. And in fact, the guy who found that out and tweeted it out for the first time, they gave him like an award. I had heard that it was something like a picture, a painting of Colonel Sanders giving him a piggyback ride. (laughs) It's funny because that's a joke they didn't announce. They just put it out there. And if someone looked at it, why are they following five Spice Girls and six guys named Herb? Yeah, that's that's very funny. That's funny. funny. In America, we say Herb. In in the UK, they say Herb. There is an H in there. As much as I'd like to talk about Herbs and Herbs all night. (laughs) Sanders obtained a patent protecting his method of pressure frying chicken in 1962 and he trademarked the phrase it's finger looking good in 1963 that's some of the smartest things he did right there yes all the fighting aside all the punching and getting in brawls with his only client as a lawyer set that (laughs) aside he knew enough to trademark something that was good like that finger Mm -hmm. looking good and knowing his recipe i mean it was a secret for a long time now it's past its time that people can look it up and, and see what it is but he ended up selling to a company And that's what actually made it the multi-billion dollar corporation that it is. Colonel Sanders sold the business in 1964 for $2 million. He continued to get a a salary and to be a brand ambassador. I think that translates to like roughly $18 million in today's money. So it's a lot of money. Yes, but the company went public two years later, listed on the New York Stock Exchange um, by 1969. And in 71, it was acquired, KFC was acquired by um, Hublin, Hublin. Inc. I think that's how you say that, Hugh Blind, for $285 million. Then the next time it was sold uh, was in 1984, 20 years from when he first sold it, sold for $840 million to wow. PepsiCo. Wow. That goes to show, seriously, and this is one of the things in my notes, and this is something on my takeaway list, and we can talk about this later. 
Don't ever sell 100% of the company. Yeah. If you can own 1% left over, if you're deciding you need to cash out for whatever reason, take the money and get some shares in the company. Leave some remaining shares because if they're going to if they're willing to pay you, let's say $2 million for a company, they want to make it worth way more than that. So if you own a small percentage, if he would have owned 1% of the company when they sold it for $800 million. Well, now it's worth eight and a half billion. Right. So, so his I mean, family could have had tons yeah. of money. He stayed on and sort of like would strike fear into. Oh, yes, he did. <laughs> into KFC as a company, even though it's like not really his anymore. The franchisees respected his culinary expertise and feared what the New Yorker described as, quote, the force and variety of his swearing <laughs> when he would go to a restaurant. Um, like if he didn't like how it tasted at a restaurant, yes. he was known for throwing like stuff at the on the floor and just screaming at people. And the executives at KFC referred to the the, the chicken as the Colonel's chicken. He bragged that his his gravy was so good that it'll make you throw away the darn chicken and just eat the gravy. <laughs> but the company like cut corners and and basically I don't not literally watered it down, but maybe. Didn't he um, refer to it as water with just a little bit of seasoning? Yeah. So he went to one of the KFC restaurants and it disappointed him. And he would <laughs> apparently like push the food onto the floor. So Hugh Blind, who I said bought it mm-hmm. at one point, they they tried to sue him for libel after he publicly described their gravy as being sludge with a wallpaper taste. <laughs> in, in the 70s, he told the Louisville Courier Journal, he said, quote, my God, that great, probably in some Kentucky, sure. thick Kentucky accent. My God, that gravy is horrible. They buy tap water for 15 to 20 cents per thousand gallons, and then they mix it with flour and starch and end up with pure wallpaper paste. And I know wallpaper paste by God because I've seen my mother make it. There's no nutrition in it, and they ought not to be allowed to sell it. Crispy recipe is nothing in the world but a damn fried dough ball stuck, <laughs> stuck on some chicken. <laughs> he said that on a, in a newspaper? Yeah. And yeah. he's the brand ambassador? Yeah, so he was apparently like, as he got older... He was not only just getting older and pro- maybe a little sure. bit senile, but he also did not care. He's and, a firecracker. And he felt like, you know, it was his brand that that they were watering down. And, and yeah, as we've talked about, he was a fighter. He did not. You're talking about a guy down. who had a shootout with somebody and almost <laughs> killed somebody. <laughs> yes. And that's how he beat his competition. Man, he was a fighting Southern man. and Not a very good lawyer. Not a very good lawyer. I would say even maybe not the best businessman. I think that he had some great ideas, was able to copyright and trademark a few things that really helped him. And I think he had the drive to push it, but his temper, I think, got in the way a lot. And it was other people, other businessmen and women who took it to be the multi-billion dollar corporation that it is, but it did start with an idea. You know, a lot of people want to build a business, want to build a brand so that they can sell it. Mm -hmm. You know, you start with a good idea or a good product, and then eventually you sell off that, that, the whole thing. Um, But that's maybe not the best route to just sell it, wash your hands of it and walk away. Um, the best thing potentially you can do is remain some sort of owner, mm-hmm. have some equity stake in it because the reason you're, that somebody's going to buy it is they want to build it even further. Right. So why not go along for the ride and, and stay plugged in? The Spanx lady, what's her name? Sarah Blakely? Yeah. Same thing she did. She sold a major right. portion of her company, but it, like maintains a large portion of and she's on the board. Right. So someone just gave her a fat few hundred million dollars and she's still in charge of the company. Mm-hmm. So it's like, that's kind of a cool way of doing it. Yeah. They, they, they like what she was doing. They liked the brand. So they gave her a lot of money. Now they're going to take it to the next level and she's a part of it. Mm-hmm. I think that's smart. I think that my takeaway is, well, first off, branding is very, very important. And also sometimes you're the problem. You're wondering why your company isn't going a certain direction, why there's issues, why your employees suck all the time. Maybe it's you. Maybe you got the temper problem. You know, a lot of times I have to take a look at myself and be like, all right, if things aren't working out in my companies, maybe it's my fault. I would say my final like takeaway with him is just don't ever quit. Yeah. Because as we talked about, the, the guy had basically every type of job you could have under the sun. Um, he never quit. Mm -mm. He just, he kept going. And, you know, if, if this thing didn't work out, uh, he'd go do something different. He'd go work on the railroad. Um, and that is the story of his career until he was basically in a pinch at 65 years old. And, you know, he could have given up, uh, and, and taken an easier route, um, many times during his life. But, 
you know, I, for better or worse, I'm not sure an easier route was an option back right. then. You know, I mean, you're talking about, you know, around 1900. Surviving was hard. Surviving was hard. Thriving so, was impossible. Yeah, absolutely. hundred percent. And so he, um, you know, just kept surviving and fighting and not giving up. And even at 65 years old, when he only had $105 coming in from social security, he said, you know what? I, I've, I've got one more trick and made it work. A lot of the millionaires in this world, they didn't become millionaires till they were in their forties and fifties. We all feel like we have to be rich and successful by the time we hit 30. But the truth is maybe we don't have enough experience yet to really understand how the world works. Talk about our lives. I feel like our whole lives have just been figuring out how to get to this point, surviving to this point, And then now it's to a point to where we can take it on and we can thrive. So yeah. I think uh, it, it's kind of inspirational in an odd way. In an odd Kentucky kind of yeah. way. Shout out to Kentuckians. Yes. You guys are tough people. <laughs> I know a few Kentuckians, they will shoot you. <laughs> Over a sign. Over a sign. A very interesting man. Go watch or read about him. He's he's an interesting dude. Some of the quotes he has out there are just insulting and hilarious at the same time. Never give up. Be tough and trademark your ideas. <laughs> oh my gosh, yes. Trademark, trademark, trademark. Oh, you want to wrap this up? Sure. Wrap yeah. it up today. Appreciate you guys. Thanks for listening. Um, if you haven't yet, please make sure you like and subscribe. We uh, we do read our comments. We try to respond back as much as we can. So Comments are hilarious. Please. They're funny. Yeah. Tell us a good KFC story, too. Yeah. But uh, yeah, appreciate you. Thanks so much. We'll see you next time. The thoughts and opinions on this show do not reflect those of our advertisers, employers, or other affiliates. The content should not be considered legal or financial advice. The Chasing Mountains podcast is a production of Chasing Mountains Media. Copyright 2022.